I think a good scientist is someone that is never 100% sure, and that's what keeps you asking these questions about the natural world and wanting to learn about it. Hello, I'm Loïc Prigent, and you're listening to Louis Vuitton Extended, the podcast. This episode takes us to Australia, in the region of Queensland, Cape York. This is where Dr. Dan Natouche, a field scientist, conservation expert and reptile biologist, is playing an important role for biodiversity with his conservation charity, People for Wildlife. Listen to our conversation about balance between nature and people and some funny anecdotes about wildlife. Hello Dan, bonjour Dan. Can I call you Dan? Please do, please do. Call me Loic. Right. You're a conservation scientist, you have a PhD in philosophy and you are a reptile expert. Can you tell me about your background? Yeah, of course. So I'm actually a, a New Zealander. I was born in New Zealand and unlike most other New Zealand children, for whatever reason, I had a fascination with snakes and other wildlife. <laughs> Starting at what age? Oh gosh, I think for as long as I can remember. Probably since I was, was aged five, I used to watch documentaries on the Discovery Channel and other, other programs. And that's quite unusual for New Zealanders because New Zealand has no snakes. And so as soon I, <laughs> as I was able to, I did what we say is jumping the ditch, which is the piece of water between New Zealand and Australia, and I, I came to live in Australia where I could further that passion. Why were you obsessed by uh, reptiles? I don't know, it's a, it's a good question. I think they're very enigmatic but unknown. They have a diversity and a beauty that is astounding and I think that that general knowledge that we as human beings don't know much about them, it really ignited within me a curiosity to, to know more about them. And as, as I did, I grew that expertise and that interest went from snakes to also to other wildlife and the landscapes that they live in. And that's, that's how I came to do what I do now. Were you interested by uh, controlling your fears, like in touching snakes, approaching snakes? I never actually had a fear. My brother actually lived in Vancouver in Canada. And I don't know if you've seen on Discovery Channel there, but in the winter, these snakes go into caves and they den together. They're called garter snakes. And they come out in springtime and they slither around together mating in the heat of the sun. And there are these large writhing balls of thousands and thousands of snakes. And I came mm, across sure. a small one of these and was able to lift up many snakes in my hand at a time. And <gasps> since then I was fascinated by them. You're lucky. <laughs> so I'm told. What, what was the moment, the event or the meeting that made you realize you are going to spend your life promoting biodiversity and sustainability? I don't think there was ever a single moment. There was no eureka moment. As I said, I was, I was born with a fascination for nature and for animals and also a deep curiosity about, about the natural world. I wanted to know why does that animal move like that? Or why is this forest growing here and not there? And I would think about the things I would try to do to find out the answer. And so I think that that curiosity, my love of nature, and the, obviously the, the recognition that humanity is, is unfortunately destroying much of that wonder without even first learning about it has really driven me to, to protect and conserve it. And you're now uh, working on uh, studying and uh, preserving Cape York in Queensland. Can you tell us about this place? Why is it so special? Yeah, Cape York is a, a remarkable part of the world. I mean, it's home to a huge diversity of habitats. And despite being a part of Australia that is fragile in many ways, it also has this inherent resilience because it's an interface between the Australian continent and also New Guinea to the north. And so it has many species that are obviously Australian, but many species that have come down during periods where those two land masses were connected, so it shares much of the flora and fauna. To give you an example of why it's so special, I think off the top of my head, it contains approximately one third of all of the mammals. 
In Australia, half of all of Australia's birds and about a quarter of all their reptiles and amphibians. So from a diversity point of view, it is incredible. And also the people that live there, the indigenous people, are equally remarkable due to their connection with that landscape. This means there's tons and tons and tons of birds over there? There are a lot of birds. I can't give you a figure off the top of my head, but if you include seabirds, shorebirds, parrots, cockatoos, all of the different species, there are many, many birds. And can you tell us about the specific uh, location in Queensland? So it's named the Aputama National Park, right? Yeah, it's, it's actually a, a putama, it's an Aboriginal area of Aboriginal freehold land. So the indigenous people have, have been given back the land by the Australian government and they are keeping it and conserving it for their, for their future generations. And so it's not actually the national park, so it doesn't receive that formal protection so we have come on board in a partnership with them and with Louis Vuitton to ensure that that special part of the world is, is conserved. And there are several different Aboriginal clan groups in the area, and the word Aputama in, in local Aboriginal language, it, it means everyone. And so it's a coming together of everyone and is quite reflective of our partnership because we're bringing French luxury groups, conservation experts from around the world, indigenous groups that call this place home, and uh, coming up together with this, this unique partnership. Can you tell me about the bonds you have with uh, indigenous people? Yeah, of course. So I, I've had a long history of, of living and working in this part of the world. I, I fell in love with it from an early age, initially because I was there chasing snakes, as I said earlier, that fascination with snakes. But since then, my interest has also become more academic um, and it has also had a big place where I have looked at ways that we can help people on that landscape. How can we protect the people on that landscape and protect the landscape and the biodiversity itself? And so I wanted to, after doing a master's degree there and a, a PhD there, I wanted to be able to, to give something back because I had gained a lot. And so because we had or I had this relationship with the local people there, it was, a, let's say, a, a perfect, perfect marriage. And you founded uh, People for Wildlife in 2020? Yes, that's exactly right. We, it was founded during the COVID pandemic where I had a bit of downtime and I was, as I think we all did, right, during the COVID period, we all stopped <laughs> and we thought, What are we doing with our lives? Are we achieving the impact we want to have? And I was fortunate enough to be doing many, many wonderful things and working with wonderful people, but I want to do more and more and have more positive impact. And this, this is what came from that realization, this organization. Uh, how did you pick the name? How did you decide for this name, People for Wildlife? Many wildlife conservationists believe that managing wild places and wildlife is about managing the land or about managing the wildlife. But in my experience, managing land and managing wildlife requires a big people component. You really need to manage the people. The threatening processes or the reason why this species is endangered is most often due to people. And so there is a need if we are going to conserve wild places and the species that live there, we need to give people a reason to conserve them. For example, if, if you are a, if you go to Southern Africa as a conservation scientist and say, local person, you must protect the lions because we, we've seen the Lion King, we love lions because they're beautiful animals, But local people in Africa often say, but we don't want the lions. They eat our children, they eat our livestock, they're dangerous, we don't want them around. And the same is true for elephants and other species. And so when people are living with wildlife, when they're bearing the costs of living with wildlife, then they don't value them in the same way that we do. And so you need to give them a reason to, to value them. And that can be done in many different ways. But this is, is really why the people aspect of 
the wildlife conservation organization is really front and center of what we do. And I, I think we could all agree that we're all people for wildlife. Can you tell us about your, your greatest uh, achievement at uh, People for Wildlife? What are you the most proud of? Yeah, wow, it's, a, it's probably a difficult question. We, we've achieved so many different things, you know. I could, I could speak about the new species that we've discovered that have never been described no. by science or the fire management plans we're creating mm. to ensure that proper burning is taking place to protect biodiversity and to reduce carbon emissions. But, you know, I think the, the thing I'm probably most proud of is actually the way we work. Not necessarily what we've achieved, but the fact that we're able to achieve things in a place where, many, where few other people are. You know, it's, it's our respect for the local people of the area, the ability to operate in that challenging landscape. I mean, most people in conservation organizations don't operate in places like Apurama because it's just so challenging. Um, but because of our knowledge of, of the people and the landscape, and importantly, the, the needs of those people and of that landscape, we're able to operate efficiently and effectively and, and have impact, as I said, in a place where, where few others can. And I, I'm really proud of our team, probably most of all, that we're able to have those successes, which are very, you know, we can shout about this new species and this new discovery, but the fact that we've set up something that is sustainable and can continue to have impact in the long term, even if it's not cool or sexy or communicable to the world, <laughs> we are having that impact and I'm really proud of that. Come on, tell, tell me how does it feel to discover a new species? How does it feel? It must be crazy. It, it is, it is. You, you honestly, you get these things in the hand and you, you look uh. at it for a bit and you think, no. Surely not. <laughs> and then you think, you know, you're always questioning or double checking. I think a good scientist is someone that is, is never 100% sure. There's always uncertainty. And that's what keeps you asking these questions about, about the natural world and wanting to learn about it. But it is a, an amazing sense of euphoria or excitement when you have, when you've found something and, you know, you're thinking for the first time, I could be the person that's that's seen this you know it's it's it is quite remarkable so do, do you get to name them you get to name them um, it depends on the species ah. it depends there, there's a lot of things that go into it there are actually rules about about how you <laughs> name species it's not a free-for-all and it's a little bit boring to be honest so I won't won't bore the people listening but um, yeah it's quite quite technical it takes a very long time but you do get to name Name the species, yes. Oh, wow. How does Louis Vuitton connect with your mission? Because you have uh, several partners. You have uh, conservatory organizations and Louis Vuitton. How did you connect? I've had a long relationship with, with Louis Vuitton because in other capacities, we consult and do work with United Nations organizations and governments, helping them to ensure that what they're doing is always more and more sustainable. And so obviously LV or Louis Vuitton has, has an ambition to be more sustainable, to do the right thing. And I think our organizations work so well together because so many of LV's raw materials come from nature, whether it's, it's leathers or shells or essential oils that's used in their, their fragrances and their perfumes. And, and so much of the beauty and the products they make, they're inspired by nature, right? And therefore, you have this organization that actually really values nature. Its creative DNA is inspired by nature. And so it, it really supports our conviction as people for wildlife that by giving value to nature, people have this desire to conserve it, this incentive to conserve it, natural uh, raw materials and conservation. And to give you an example, we haven't done the formal description yet, but we have discovered two new species of, of mushrooms. They're two species of Australian native chanterelles, and they're delicious. Ooh. I don't want to get into trouble, but I would hazard a guess <laughs> that they could be more delicious than the French chanterelles. Anyway, <laughs> exactly. Anyway, we're, we're in the early stages of creating a boutique 
indigenous business around the sustainable harvest and sale of these mushrooms to high-end consumers. That's so nice. And can you tell me about uh, your typical day? <laughs> well, I mean, I do get to have a lot of adventures, of course. Mm. Um, but, but to be fair, a lot of my time is spent behind a computer, more, more than you'd think. And a, and a big reason for that is because operating safely and effectively in landscapes like a Putama means you need to do a huge amount of planning. Right? So you're going mm -hmm. into remote areas. It's not about just doing the job. It's about surviving and being able to get the work done at the same time. And, and, and not just do the work, but do the work in a way that has impact. Nothing really goes the way you expect because you're dealing with nature. And so that takes up a large amount of my time, ensuring the team is safe and, and all these sorts of things. Oh. And you, you've been recording lots of uh, soothing and moving wildlife sounds and footage. Is it for like research or also educational purpose? That's actually for research. And so we put out audio arrays. So essentially microphones, they sit remotely out in the forest or in the wetlands and they turn on in the early morning and at dusk, and they record the sounds of nature. And it's not just because it sounds beautiful, it's because we can then use that audio to run through a sophisticated analysis program, and AI essentially will analyze it, and it will tell us what species we're calling. And that helps us monitor over long time periods whether the biodiversity in that area is, is going up, whether it's going down, whether it's remaining healthy. You know, the sounds of undisturbed nature are just so powerful and beautiful and serene. And so, yeah, we, we recognize that, that people need to hear it. I guess so, yes. That sounds super exciting, yes. Well, thank you so, so much, Dan, for taking the time today. It's a pleasure, Loic. Thank you very, very much for having me. What I loved about this conversation with uh, Dan Natush is that a, a project that he launched during the lockdown in, in COVID is now at this stage and uh, they're discovering species. And I think it's super encouraging that you can make a difference, you can launch a project, you can have an idea and uh, make it work. We share one hashtag, which is um, PFW, Paris Fashion Week, People for Wildlife. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Louis Vuitton podcast, Extended. I'll be inviting you soon to discover new stories in the company of visionary personalities. Find all the episodes on your favorite listening platforms, such as Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You should subscribe to the podcast to get notifications so you don't miss any upcoming episodes. I look forward to welcome you back.